book of 2 Peter this morning. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter uh, 1. Just to say I don't have a mic on me for the, uh, res- for the recording. I don't have a mic. <laughs> Bartosz is busily waving at me like, turn on your mic. And I don't have a mic. So it's difficult for me to switch it on. (laughs) There we go. I've got a mic now. Thank you. I think my mother should have called me Mike. Anyway, here we go. All right, 1 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1 is where we are this morning. 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading in verse... 16, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, where Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from the heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we trust the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. I want to bring before you this morning a message that I've entitled COVID Conspiracy and the Coming of the Lord. It's a message that I preached at a prophecy conference in Sunderland. And, uh, you know, I felt it was something that we could use and something that we ought to take account of and think about in these days. 2020, I'm sure you'll agree, has been quite an interesting year. Uh, none of us saw this coming, not you, not me, not anyone. But here we are in the midst of a global pandemic, which has taken already one million lives worldwide. And to one degree or another, we find ourselves subject to restrictions and protocols that just a few months ago would have seemed unthinkable. Now, many people are sincerely asking where these events sit within God's plan for the ages. However, the answer that many believers have come up with is, I believe, wholly unsatisfactory. You see, many of our brethren have bought into what is known as conspiracy theory, which is a mixture of truth, half-truth, and whole lies that are constructed in such a way as to put together what seems to be a very convincing argument. Sadly, of that, dispensational truth, particularly in the gospel in general, has ended up somewhat discredited. You see, we have this morning an issue, a question of doubt. There are people, believers among them, who refer to this present crisis as a plandemic or as a scamdemic. Such people are convinced that the whole world is caught up in a mass conspiracy Uh, that is orchestrated by a handful of individuals uh, at the top who are desirous to bring about a new world order. Now, let me say to you that that very term, a new world order, is not a biblical term. It's not a theological term. It's not even a prophetical term. It's a political term. It's a term that was first used by President Woodrow Wilson after World War I when he described how the world would be a different place following that war. 
And, uh, you know, there's always been a change in world order. Even when you go to the Bible, you have the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, each one bringing in, as it were, a new world order, a new way of doing things with new people at the top. So we've got to be careful with our terminology because a lot of people use this term as though somehow or other it has biblical or prophetic significance. Now, as part of this conspiracy of evil, some have proclaimed at the outset of this crisis that the new 5G communications network was the cause of the illness, that the conspiracy involved raising these 5G masks around the country, which would diminish your immune system and expose you to this illness and thus fulfill uh, their, this part of their uh, objective in trying to bring about this new world order. But sadly, there was and is not a shred of evidence to support this theory. You know, yet Christians persisted in promoting this view. One Christian that I spoke to online and uh, who promoted this view uh, used the conspiracy theorist David Icke to back up uh, their position and showed a video of David Icke promoting this idea that the 5G masts were part of this great global conspiracy. And when I pointed out to them that David Icke was a conspiracy theorist, is a conspiracy theorist, and that he claims to be the very son of God, this Christian came back with, well, that's not, that's not important. What's important is that his message is true. Well, here, do you not see the irony here? The irony is that you have a Christian who's trying to convince you that you're living in the last days because of a 5G uh, network of, uh, of masks that have been put up and using someone who's a false Christ to, to uh, support and cement that view. And yet what was one of the signs of the times that the Lord Jesus warned us of? That there would be false Christs. And what did he say? Don't go after them. He didn't say it doesn't matter as long as they're speaking the truth. He said, don't go after them. Don't pursue them. Don't give them oxygen. Don't give them an opportunity. The fact is that this nation was really right behind the times in terms of 5G technology, you know, way, way behind the rollout uh, when the virus struck people down. And to boot, the government in the month of July cancelled its contract with Huawei, the Chinese uh, company charged with advancing this technology, and they set back the progress of it by about four years. In fact, if you even back then, before that happened, I looked to see how many areas in our nation actually were able to access 5G technology, and there were very few areas of the United Kingdom at the start of the year who were able to access that kind of technology. Not only that, you would think that if the government now has stopped the progress and the rollout of the technology, that the virus then would recede because less people would be exposed. But actually, as we now know, the virus is ongoing. And uh, not only that, but the virus exists in third world countries where they don't even have 4G technology and possibly not even 3G technology. And yet the virus is rampant in those nations. Then, of course, we are often pointed to the usual array of villains in this conspiracy. And I've heard these names for years and years and years now. The Rothschilds, the banking dynasty. The billionaire investor, George Soros. George Soros is public enemy number one in the minds of conspiracists. He's the main guy. He's the guy who's pushing to bring in the new world order. I, I look at George Soros and I see he's 90 years old. I'm thinking he better get on with it. <laughs> he's not a very successful dictator. If he's now 90 years old and he still hasn't got what he desires, people say, well, he was a Nazi collaborator. I read in the Jerusalem Post just yesterday that he was actually one who fled from the Nazis. He's a Jewish man from a Jewish family who fled from the Nazis. 
And so lives are told to uphold a particular position. Then you have, in more recent times, Bill Gates, the computer whiz, who apparently spent a lifetime building the Microsoft computer network empire so that he could develop a fixing that would kill a million plus people. This is the conspiracy. Now, I've watched the clips. I've, I've read the articles, you know, and I see little excerpts put together of different things that these people say. And here's the thing. Bill Gates is a very clever man. And no matter what you think about him, I would think a very clever man who was intent on leading genocide to kill a million people would be smart enough not to go on TV or sit in an interview or, or record it in a public article. You wouldn't share it, would you? It'd be the worst idea in history. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no doubt that George Soros and Bill Gates and others have liberal views. They call themselves progressives. I don't necessarily uh, agree with their ethics or their ethos. Uh, I certainly don't agree with their worldview in many cases. But friends, a Christian, if he's anything, is supposed to rejoice in the truth. To rejoice in the truth. And, you know, even the Bible tells the truth about God's enemies. Sometimes the Bible says good things about bad men. And the reason for that is that God is a truth teller. He's a holy God. And you and I should also be truth tellers. We shouldn't be people who seek to slander others or to skew facts or to take snippets of conversations or interviews and put them all together so as to make a case. Now, don't, again, don't get me wrong, you know, but We've got to be very careful as Christians that we don't just hit a share button on our computers every time somebody says something that we feel fits the agenda and helps our cause. You know, I would say in the average week I get two, three, four, five links from people, different people in the church and out of the church, uh, pastors and, and regular church members and uh, just give me all these videos to watch. If I spent my week doing what that, I would spend the whole week watching conspiracy videos. <laughs> and the one recently sent me a video, and he, he said, you've got to watch this. Well, it was half an hour long. I thought, well, he's, he's a friend of mine. He's a, he's a godly man. He's a good pastor. I'll, I'll watch it. Just It's only half an hour of my life to be wasted, and I can take that time. So I took the time, and I watched this, this uh, video, and it began, as many of these videos do, they all, if you've watched them, you'll know, they, you'll know the format well, they all begin with this very foreboding music, almost like leading you into a horror film. And then you have some character that you've likely never seen in your life before, sitting in a, in a darkened room that's made to look like a radio studio, which is probably his kitchen. And he sits behind a mic, and he's going to share with you this secret that he has, this information that he's come by that nobody else knows that's going to indicate to you that there is this great conspiracy of evil taking place in the world. And so I got this video, and it began the same way, the, the forbidding, foreboding music, and then the character sitting in the, before the mic, and so on. And he reeled out the usual characters, George Soros, and Bill Gates, and Al Gore, and Prince Charles. You know, the, of course, David Icke believes that Prince Charles and his family are alien who have somehow metamorphosized into humans, that they're lizard people, and this kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, all of these characters came out, and the bacon conspiracy was that in the Davos 2020 conference, these people got together in a little huddle, and they conspired to unleash the COVID-19 virus upon the world so as to eliminate huge swathes of the world's population in order to legitimize the use of vaccines, which they would then have invested in, which would make them lots of money. This is the idea that's going around. Now, conspiracists claim to have the inside track on these things that they're familiar with these shitty figures and they know what's going on in these darkened rooms. But here's my question. How do you know? How can anybody know? 
You know, I, I just took a, a cursory glance and went back and looked at the Davos conference. The first thing I noticed about it was it was held in January, January 2020 in Switzerland. Now, the virus began to emerge in December. At least that's when it first came to the headlines. It was probably even ongoing before December. But nevertheless, in China, people were dying in December. We actually know already that the first British person who died of COVID-19 actually died in December. So if these guys are getting together to get a, a plan whereby they're going to unleash the virus, they're one month behind the time. And not only that, I then discovered that the Davos conference is attended by 3,000 people. Now, I would suggest to you, if I was going to run a conference like that, if I was going to hold a secret meeting that was going to lead to the genocide of thousands and millions of people so that I might profit, if I was going to hold a meeting like that, I certainly wouldn't open the door to 3,000 people. I might entrust one or two. But I, I certainly wouldn't open the door for everybody and anybody. I definitely wouldn't sit at a microphone and tell you all about it. You see, Davos is not a conference that is attended by a handful of plotters, but by many people, world leaders, businessmen, industrialists, celebrities, and others. And if you're going to host a secret meeting, it's probably a good idea to keep as many people away as possible, because by definition, a secret meeting ought to be what? Secret. Yes, it's, it's elitist, there's no question about that. And I have no doubt there are conversations that take place there that ethically are poor, maybe even nefarious. But how do I know, is the question. How do you know? How does anybody know? How does a fellow sitting four, five, six thousand miles away in California in his kitchen with a mic in front of him producing a little video as we're doing by means of his mobile phone or whatever, how does he know? He doesn't know. So now we've got Christians who act as though the search for the vaccine is a doorway to the mark of the beast that the wearing of a face covering somehow makes you complicit in some kind of grand satanic scheme. It's dehumanizing, they say. It's robbing me of my personality, they say. You do realize that God told people to wear face coverings, Leviticus 13 and 45. That lepers were required under the law to wear a face covering. Was God dehumanizing those people? Was God robbing those people of their personality? Was God complicit in some great satanic plan? Some will say, well, you know, face coverings won't protect you from COVID. God told lepers to wear face coverings. It wasn't about protecting the leper. He already had the disease. It was about mitigating the risk. It was about limiting the reach of human aerosols. And here's the deal with this illness. And let's be honest, it's a real illness. Here's the deal with this illness. The deal is that it is asymptomatic. So you could be sitting here today having that illness, unaware of the fact that you have that illness, and spreading it to someone for whom it might prove to be fatal. Some people say, well, you know, the, the virus particles are smaller than the mesh of your face covering. And do you think that leprosy microbes were larger than the mesh of face coverings? Of course not. Who is wiser, man or God? Some people say, well, I find it uncomfortable. Join the club. Who doesn't? You know, I know right now they're producing some that'll go with your dress and some that have uh, brand names on them for those who are fashionably conscious. But at the end of the day, when the government says you can take those things off, I guarantee you nobody's going to be walking around saying, I, I love these, they feel comfortable. <laughs> nobody's going to wear them. And you need to, we need to think of others. 
of, of people in society as a whole, and here in the church of brothers and sisters in Christ, some of whom who have come through major surgeries and who are cancer survivors and have respiratory illnesses and others who are elderly and vulnerable and who feel assured when people around them are wearing face masks. Well, surely to goodness, their concerns ought to be considered. Would that not be the Christian thing to do? And besides that, it's the law of the land. It's the law of the land. Now, the law allows exemptions. Primary school are, children are exempted. Infants are exempted. The law says that people who cannot put on a covering uh, cannot wear one because they have a physical or mental illness or an impairment of some kind or disability. Well, they're exempt. They say you're exempt if wearing one gives you, causes you severe distress. Not discomfort, but distress. But here's the thing. Do we as Christians really have the right to break a law that is not anti-biblical? In fact, by doing so, we are potentially harming our testimony and hurting the reputation of our church. So, uh, so we, we've instilled this, this governmental law, not because we want to be difficult and make church a miserable experience. We want church to be a wonderful time together. But let me give it to you straight. Whatever the arguments may be, pro or con, face coverings, there is no scriptural or spiritual reason why you cannot wear one. Now, I'm not saying we cannot question the government. I'm not saying we cannot question the imposition of the measures the government has taken. I'm not suggesting we can't question whether or not the disease is, is dangerous enough, or indeed if, it's, if, it is, uh, if it is so severe that it, it warrants these very draconian measures in some cases. And like everybody else, you know, all of us have moments of confusion about this, and we hear mixed messages, and we think, well, what is the point of this, and what is the point of that? You know, I was joking with Pastor Borland, and I was in a restaurant with him, and we came in one way and we went to go out and the lady says, no, you can't go out that way. You've got to go this way. And we said, that's because the virus only goes one way. <laughs> of course, we were being a little facetious. But there are times when we say, well, what is the point of this rule? What is the point of this regulation? Why is it I can't meet at times with my family, but I can come to church and meet with everybody else? Or I can go to a pub and meet with everybody else? Or to a restaurant and meet with every, even total strangers? But what I'm saying is this, not that we can't question government policy, that's an issue of politics. But what I'm saying is we cannot, we must be careful not to mix truth with error, to mix political positions with biblical principles, to mix scripture with conspiracy so as to discredit the faith and to hurt particularly the doctrine of the end times. Look, Peter says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Christians now are being viewed as, as tin hat wearers. You know, the kind of people who are just weird. And, and the reason for that is because many of them are propagating these theories online. And, and you know, the idea that people were critical of end-time doctrine is not a new thing. Peter himself is battling this. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4 that there were those in his time who said, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So it wasn't like there wasn't people in Peter's time who questioned uh, the validity of end-time doctrine. But Peter spoke, speaks to us, he says, Understand something. In promoting the coming of the Lord, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. It's a question of discernment. You see, folks might legitimately say, well, don't the present circumstances suggest that we're living in the last days? Aren't there things happening in society that would suggest to us that we're nearer the coming of the Lord? And for sure there are. And, and Jesus himself castigated the Pharisees because they didn't read the signs of the times. But this, this pandemic, it certainly has revealed certain things and features which parallel with our understanding of the end times without drawing alongside the likes of the 
David Icke or Piers Corbin or some of these other people who are weckos. We've seen how, for example, in this pandemic, it's led to government overreach. So the government has set aside democracy and has established essentially a little dictatorship at times, which politicians are questioning. That may well be that the society itself is being conditioned to accept control from the top. That when the tribulation comes, uh, people will already be in a, in a mindset where they to the rule of Antichrist. We've seen uh, how that this measure of uh, increased control is, uh, is somehow justified upon the basis of human fear, uh, whether this is the fear of terrorism or the fear of disease. And of course, societal fear was all, is also an, a sign of the time. Jesus said that toward the end, men would have hearts that were failing them for fear. There's the push toward a cashless society. The Bible teaches that. And of course, it's not just money, but people themselves that are being tracked and traced by means of technology. And recently, some have talked about a health passport, whereby if you haven't been vaccinated, uh, that you won't be able to enter certain venues, you won't be able to go to concerts, you won't be able to go to sports games, and so on and so forth. Well, that certainly has a parallel with the end of time, because there's coming a point where the government is going to dictate who can buy and who can sell. The Bible teaches that. So we have no problem with any of that. Even this policy whereby the government encourages people to grass on their neighbors, to look out the window and call the police and tell them if somebody has seven people in their house instead of six or tell them if there's a big crowd gathering or whatever. You know, that too is a feature of life under communism. And the Lord also highlighted that as a feature of the tribulation period, where he talks about how a son will turn in his father, and so on, in Matthew chapter 10. These signs and signals are all there. So is that why we expect the coming of the Lord? No. We expect the coming of the Lord because the Bible tells us he's coming. That's why. It's a question of doctrine. Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. The phrase cunningly devised is one word in the Greek, sovizo, from which we get the word sophist or sophistry. A sophister is someone who makes an argument, creates an argument that is artfully framed, artfully framed by his own human ingenuity. It's a clever argument. It's a brilliant argument, but it's not a true argument. It's fallacious. And that's what a conspiracy theory is. It's cleverly designed. It's an argument that propagates truth, half-truth, and whole lies in a careful construct so as to produce a myth. Now, Peter says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He's talking about himself. He's talking about Peter, James, and John. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. He's talking about their shared experience when they climbed the Mount of Transfiguration, and there before their eyes they were given a preview of the kingdom that was to come when the Lord Jesus was momentarily changed from that physical human form that they were so familiar with as a carpenter from Nazareth into this glorious mud majestic figure, which was, of course, a picture of how he would appear when he comes. And, they, and Peter says, we were up there. We, we saw this. We heard things. He speaks of the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, notice, he's already made known unto these people something of the coming, the power and coming of the Lord. He says, I've already addressed this. And if you were to go back into 1 Peter and read through see that he has addressed the second coming numerous times. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, he calls it a lively hope. In verse 4, it's salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
In verse 7 of chapter 1, he speaks about the appearing of Jesus Christ. In verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 12, he talks about the glory of God in the day of visitation. In chapter 5, he talks about how the Lord would bring a, an elder's reward, a pastor's reward. And in summary, in chapter 4 of that book, and if you want to look there for a moment, in verses 7 to 11, he tells us that the end of all things is at hand. Notice what he says, and he, and he gives us certain exhortations here, but the end of all things is at hand. He says, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I love this little section of 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'll tell you why. Because it deals with the Lord's coming, not not just from the point of view of a program, not just from the point of view of a plan, but from the point of view of practicality. He says the end is near, the Lord is coming, and in the light of his coming, here are some things you ought to think about. Here are some things that you ought to employ in your life. And you know, here, we're, here is Peter addressing this early church, these early church Christians, without a pandemic, without technology, without vaccines, without a face mask, and, he's, and, he's, and he tells us they are expecting the Lord to appear at any time. Now here's what I want you to get, folks. Whilst we may talk about signs of the times, there is no sign necessary for Jesus to come and catch away his church. None. All of the signs, without exception, pertain to the tribulation period. We live before the tribulation period. Jesus will come before the tribulation period, and he will catch away and rescue his people before judgment falls on this planet. So in that respect, you and I do not have a sign that is definite that will tell us the Lord is coming. And here, is, here are these people living 2,000 years ago, and Peter reminds them that the end of all things is at hand. In other words, they believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Now, history, of course, tells us that Jesus didn't come in their lifetime. But that does not diminish the doctrine of imminency. So such being the case... Peter issues several exhortations to those expecting the Lord to appear. And the first of those is in verse 7. He says, be ye therefore sober. He says, be discerning. Actually, he's telling us that we should not be given to wild thinking about prophecy. That's what he's telling us. Peter's telling us that we should exercise sound judgment, that we should be of our right mind, that we should not be given to free thinking in prophetic areas. He says, watch unto prayer. Why is that important? Because when your doctrine is confused, your prayer life will be confused. He says, have fervent charity. He doesn't tell us to go and protest the government. He doesn't tell us to go marching on the streets. He doesn't tell us to fill everybody's hearts with fear. He tells us to show love to have charity. And then he says, be hospitable. Open your homes and open your hearts. And then in verse 10, he tells you to exercise your spiritual gift. As every man hath received the gift, even so the minister, the same one to another. And in verse 11, he tells us to rest on the word of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Not news headlines, not hearsay, not conspiracy theory. The word of God. To underscore his point, Peter in chapter 1 of, of the second epistle highlights his own personal experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he says that although his experience was real, although it was undoubtable, although it was something that actually happened to him and the others, still with all, it was not this premise upon which he believed, but the promise of God upon which he believed. 
As wonderful and true as his experience was, the apostle tells us we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We have something far more certain than our experience. We have something far more reliable, trustworthy, far more dependable than our experience. We have the Word of God. He says, we're not going to believe that the Lord Jesus is coming because we went up a mountain and saw him glorified. We believe he's coming because the Bible says so. That's what he says. Now, my friends, we, and here's my real concern here with with the church today, is that we're in danger of repeating the mistakes of the 19th century Adventists, the Millerites, and the Russellites, and we don't have time this morning to get into all of that, but just to say to you that from those people came the Seventh-day Adventist movement and the Jehovah's Witness movement, and that they interpreted Scripture in the light of events that were current in their day, and they birthed cults as a consequence. And we've got to be careful that we don't replicate that mistake, that we just stick with the Word. Even in these strange and and weird and and, and crazy and confusing times, the most important thing we do is stick with the Word. When it comes to the matter of prophecy, how important it is that we rest our faith on God's explicit revelation and not on the wild and fanciful ideas of speculation, of human speculation, that our footing stands upon inspiration, not upon imagination. How critical it is to the faith that we do not abandon the word of God for the words of men, how careful we must be not to add to or take from the prophetic truths we have been given already. You get to the very end of your Bible, and what is the the last warning of Scripture before the the canon of Scripture closes? It says in verse 18 of uh, chapter 22 of Revelation, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto the these things. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Friends and sisters, the speculations of men pertaining to the end times are often very wide of the mark. Often. And sometimes, worse than that, they are actually an embarrassment to the church. You know, over the years, and you know, you all know, I have taught prophecy the whole time I've been here, both in our church and out of our church. For the last 16 and a half years, you know that I have trundled the length and breadth of this nation teaching prophecy. And over those years, I've heard many, many scenarios from people I've heard from many people who have bright ideas and who have suggestions as to how prophecy is being fulfilled. And sometimes I just shake my head. One time I actually sat and prayed, Lord, please take this person away. I was so discouraged with what this individual... You know, you don't want to be rude. I'm a guest in somebody else's church. I don't want to be rude. But sometimes you hear these ideas that people have and you think... What is going on between your ears? This has got nothing to do with the Bible. You know, a fellow came to me one time and he said, you know, I had a dream. I've had this dream. And in this dream, I, I got a vision of the end times. And, uh, and, I, and I dreamt that the nation of Japan, the islands of Japan, sank into the sea. And I know this is going to happen in July of this year. Well, that was very helpful because it was May at that point. And I thought, well, I don't have long to see how this prophecy works out. And that was back in 2012 or something like that, eight years ago. And the last I know, you know, Adam Henderson and Manami are still above water sending us letters from Japan. You know, back in the 80s, some of you will remember, if you were around then, if you were saved then, the whole Procter and Gamble thing. There was a big thing about the Procter & Gamble Soap Company logo that apparently the logo was somehow a mark of the beast that it revealed the 666 of Antichrist. There was a symbol of the devil on a box of Daz or Purcell or whatever it was. (laughs) 
and Christians were up in arms. And the story was that the chief executive of the Procter and Gamble Soap Company had appeared on a the Phil Donahue show in America, and he was interviewed, and he, he admitted on that show that the Procter and Gamble Soap Company gave money to the Church of Satan, uh, and uh, that they were all devil worshippers. I mean, people were believing this stuff in 1982. Do you know what stopped it? Procter and Gamble started suing people, and they won. And guess what? Some of you are sitting going, I never heard that. I've never heard that. You know why you never heard it? Because it started costing people money. It was nonsense. Six years ago, we had John Hagee, the the TV preacher, and his his famous or infamous blood moon theory in which he said that the total eclipse of the the moon in April 2014 was the start of a tetrad of eclipses, which which, uh, coincided, two of which coincided with Jewish festivals, and that these were the signs that were spoken of in Acts chapter 2 and verse 20 and Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. No matter that there are other signs there in Acts chapter 2, and other signs there in in Revelation chapter 6, Six, and no matter that both of those passages would place you in the tribulation period. And here's the other thing. You know, he announces this, like, you know, here I've, I've got the inside knowledge in this. I'm going to show you something that no one else knows, no one else has thought of. Here's my bright idea. Here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. There's going to, be a, there's going to be an eclipse of the moon, and it's going to spark these events that will lead up to the, to the coming of the Lord. What he doesn't tell you is that there has been 62 tetrads since the first year A.D., and that eight of those coincided with Jewish festivals. And he makes it sound like it's the first. And people are shaken. And Christians at that time were pressing the share, 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 share button. Sometimes we should call that the idiot button. Because they don't think about what they're sharing. Does God really expect us to abandon our Bibles for news headlines? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Is God really asking us to be stargazers, to track the planets, to know where the moon is going to be at any given moment, or the sun is going to be, or the stars are going to be? Does God really expect us to do that? No, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Does God expect me to examine in the nitty-gritty every secret meeting so-called that ever takes place, read every news story and read between the lines, and read every conspiracy theory? theory and interpret scripture across those lines? No. We have a more sure word of prophecy. God does not expect me to be an epidemiologist or a virologist or an investigative journalist or a statistician or an astronomer. He expects me to be a Bible student. He expects me to read the word. He expects me to listen to what he says. But that's what's happening today. As people abandon the book in favor of a a theology that confuses current affairs with prophetic truth, we leave our Bibles and we start reading into every daily event a prophetic significance far beyond that which is legitimate. Now we're at a place where it's 5G technology, Bill Gates, vaccines, face coverings. Peter says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. And he goes on, whereunto ye do well that you take heed. He says, stop listening to your TV set, to your internet, to your friends on the social media. And start listening to what God is telling you. There's no point in having the word of God in our possession if we don't allow it to have any heed in our lives. The Bible will do us little good if we don't read it and heed it. And and he says it's not only a sure word, but Peter says it's a shining word. He says, Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Now there's no question, we are in a dark place today. Society is in a dark place. The world is in a dark place. The United States of America is as bad as I've ever seen it. I 
don't think I remember the Americas, America being in such disarray since the time of the Vietnam War. The world is a dark, murky, sinful, squalid place. But into that darkness, God has shed a ray of hope in the form of the light of his word. And the word of God continues. It's the only revelation given to us to which we must give heed until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What day dawn? The day of Christ's appearing. Previewed by Peter, denied by false teachers, confused by conspiracy theorists, but promised by a more sure word of prophecy. You see, Jesus is coming, not because of this sign or that sign, not because the conditions are right or ripe, not because of any act of man or any act of human government. He's coming because the Bible says so. And in that respect, Peter concludes this section by saying, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, he says, you cannot come to the Scriptures and impose upon it one's own interpretation. You cannot take the current affairs and the news headlines and the internet memes and mingle them all together with a few video clips that are pulled out of context here and there to build a case and then come back and say, you see, that's what the Bible teaches. That that's a private interpretation. And Peter says, don't do it. Don't surrender to cunningly devised fables. What he's telling us is this. This book is supernatural. Supernatural in its origin. It's more reliable than personal experience, whether that was his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration or your experience and mine going through a pandemic. It's more, uh, it's more reliable than popular theories. Uh, whatever those theories may be, whatever credibility you may feel they have, this is a God-breathed book. It's inspired. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's immutable. It's eternal. And brothers and sisters, here's the thing I want you to do, or not do as the case may be. I don't want you to forsake the inspired scriptures of God for hearsay and conspiracy and speculation. Let's base our faith upon the pure, unadulterated word of the living God and only the word of God and nothing but the word of God. May God bless these thoughts to your heart. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for its truth. We thank you, O God, that your word is indeed a light in a dark place, that even now as we, as we try to work our way through a world that at many times makes no sense to us, that you are still sovereign, that you are still in control, and the things that you have revealed in your word will all come to pass. The heavens and earth will pass away. Uh, but your word will never pass away. And so, Father, we, I pray that you help us not to get sidetracked, not to get our heads turned by this fellow or that fellow, but to stay faithful, to keep our noses in the books and to keep our hearts conditioned by the book and keep our lives corrected by the book and help us to live to your glory. For, Lord, we know the Lord Jesus is soon to appear, and when he comes, may he find us faithful. May he find us serving. May he find us doing what he would have us to do and not getting caught up in the speculation of imaginations, however well intended those speculations may be. I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing our final hymn this morning. Jesus is coming, sing the glad word coming for those he redeemed by his blood. Who would like to come this morning and sing as we close our service this morning?